three, two, one. <laughs> okay, um, believe me all, and I'm um, not quite sure I got, how I got into this, but I think I spoke up too soon. But, um, I've, had, I've been interested in the topic for a little while, and um, I don't quite know how, but I think it, I read about auroras, and then I saw a link to a website, which is one of the references in the, at the end of this, you'll see. And it was the, the sounds of um, spirits, which I'd sort of heard about anyway. And, um, and of course I was interested in the electronics part, you know, I bet I can build one of those and listen to it. So that's probably what got me hooked, I think. And um, so anyway, um, we'll see how we go. So um, that's the spectrum of interest. Um, it's roughly 303 kilohertz in the, that part of the band and 3 kilohertz to 15 kilohertz. These are the standard international recognised descriptions of the band. Below 300 hertz, I think they call ELF. Um, there are other signals in 50 to 50 hertz, or 5, 5 to 50 or 5 to 80. They're a lot harder to receive because you need some uh, special antenna techniques. So um, and the receiver I built, and most people build, just covers roughly 300 to um, about 10 kilohertz. is the, the spectrum we may have been interested in. And because these are, these are the frequencies of the sounds that come through the atmosphere. So the sounds are roughly divided into four top four groups. The atmospherics are just the um, bleaks, whistlers, and dawn chorus. And um, so the, these are first noticed by telegraphists on, on very long you know, telegraphy lines. You know, they used to just have the big copper wires and, um, and battery. But they could, uh, by listening on with earphones, they could also hear the, um, these sounds coming through. And uh, I think there was all sorts of um, rumours as to what they might be. Uh, but, uh, and then telephones of customers would uh, obviously would be using voice, uh, notice it too. And in the old days, in fact, when I first started working for a, a PMG as it was, we used to have very long lines out in north of Burke, Dubbo, and uh, these were just big copper lines, party lines. And I imagine most people might have heard things on the lines too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the people in the telephone exchange often heard things on the lines too. <laughs> <laughs> they were not supposed to. <laughs> um, so some studies were done in the 20s and 30s. Uh, Barkhausen was a German guy. Is that the same yeah. Barkhausen for oscillators? Barkhausen yeah. criteria? Oh, Michael, yes, yeah, I think it is too, yes. Yeah. yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, Post World War II, though, the, the war interrupted. There are very few publications um, during the war years, as you might imagine. And post World War II, when uh, almost immediately people started getting interested, and um, so Story was a, a UK academic, and uh, by doing timing and uh, things like that, he found out they were caused by lightning strikes. Most of these sounds originate from lightning strikes. And, um, in 1957 was the International Year Physical Year too, so that, that really sparked a big study. And uh, one of the reference texts you'll read from most of these things on the internet is uh, a guy named Helliwell, and he's an academic from Stanford. And I actually got his book, and um, I can understand bits of it. <laughs> uh, a true academic. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of, uh, you, you have to do, revise a lot of your optics and that sort of theory. Uh, because it's um, transmission of electromagnetic waves through media. So it's a lot of it's about that. And you have to revise your physics. Yeah. <laughs> so what can we hear? Atmospherics, or sterics, or Americans, or I think even the Germans spell it with an S, F, spherics. Clicks, whistles, and dawn chorus. So we'll just look at um, each of those. And, uh, so the first thing you'll hear most of the time is just lightning crashes, little pops and crackles. And there's 100 strikes a second roughly, <laughs> worldwide. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, um, uh, someone put a link up on their, on their website which had a map of lightning strikes over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, Richard, SKY, yeah, he put up a link, and, uh, which I've seen before, and it's just everywhere, you know. And <laughs> this is one of the, uh, the figures from uh, that reference to Helliwell, 10,000 amps per 100 microseconds. So it was pretty typical. So, so when you go out with one of these receivers, you need to keep away from that sort of signal that uh, 
So here's what it will sound like. I think it's a bit of a difference. Yeah, we'll stick up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Popcorn through. Yeah, yeah, fine, yeah. Uh, I think uh, you've rolled the tone. Yeah, they're probably separate recordings, I think. I haven't done anything to it. So, uh, these recordings I've got come from um, a project uh, by NASA called Inspire Project. And it was a little project to inspire young people to you know, get interested in physics and, and atmospherics. There's a reference at the end. If you're saying there's 100 strikes per second and we might be hearing that in that, is that suggesting that the radio waves emanating from those strikes are travelling all the way around the world without... Yes, they data. can. My word, yeah, yeah. That's right, you, you, you'll hear them. And, and they, they get Almost transmitted yeah. through the uh, ionosphere duct and through the Earth's magnetic field, which we'll, we'll see in a minute. Um, they're, they're probably closer ones. Um, now, tweaks are the, uh, the first um, odd effect you get from, uh, from lightning strikes. So, um, lightning strikes occur near the Earth, and uh, so the energy from these, which would be an electromagnetic wave, will travel through the Earth ionosphere waveguide, which I'll show you what that is, but it's essentially the lower part of the ionosphere. That, that's where it's really ducted, it's about 20 kilometres wide, and it'll travel through that. But they're uh, at night when the, the ionosphere is higher. Um, you get uh, many different ray paths, and these and the um, the energies at different frequencies arrive at different times. And so you get a, 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 a descending note tone um, from wherever you are. And, uh, yeah, some, uh, this was the description in Helliwell. Group, causes group delay to increase and affect the arrival of the train of pulses and the musical sound called the tweet. But the simple explanation is the dispersion causes higher frequencies to travel faster than the lower ones. So you'll, you'll hear your higher ones first, a fraction of a second later, the lower ones. So, so. so. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's the last sound a possum hears as he puts his feet across the tree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, now, whistlers are um, probably a special sort of um, tweet, in effect. And uh, these ones can travel um, out in the space, up into the ionosphere, and, oh, wow. yeah, and back again. <coughs> and so they can yeah. travel several thousand kilometres. And uh, basically what can happen, um, oh, I'll show you on the, on the uh, diagram in a second. So um, mm -hmm. we're in the, uh, the right belt, 35 to 50 degrees from the equator is roughly the mm -hmm. area to hear these sounds. And um, so not, a, not much of the equator, none of the poles. And um, generally from powerful lightning strikes. So I'll play things were, you know. Mm. So these are uh, received by a VLF yes. receiver. An audio amplifier with a bit of wire on it. Okay, mm, yeah. okay so there is no conversion. That's no, no, they're, they're in the audible range. They're, the audio. they're electromagnetic radiation in the audible range. So, yeah. so that, that's a crude diagram of the Earth's magnetic field. In, in, in fact, um, it's distorted by the solar wind. So uh, on one side of the say if the sun is on this side, these would be compressed. On the other side, they'd, they'd be extended out here. And um, it's shown as lines of force, but it's, there's no such thing as a line of force really. It's, it's a magnetic field. You know? Like electrons don't follow one of those lines. They'll they'll get into a particular field strength path, and they'll follow that field strength. And uh, so here's a diagram of the Earth, and the thin gap around there is basically the Earth to the lower ionosphere. And what can happen is you get a, 
a, um, a lightning strike, and the energy will go along along the uh, the Earth ionosphere gap, and then it might break through into the ionosphere, and it can travel all the way out here and back in. So it's it's the other half of the hemisphere. So the sounds you can hear from those whistlers could have originated in the northern hemisphere. But what happens is these diagrams show it that uh, this is the first one. So it got into the uh, onto a magnetic path there, and it, when it gets to here, of course it's it's entering at a very steep angle. It'll get reflected and come back. So what you hear at the other end is an extended one, and it'll reflect. And then, then it keeps you know, getting dispersed, so it gets longer and longer. So there's really long ones you hear. Mm. Might have been around this field several times. And, um, okay. Yeah, so you might think, oh, that's, that's really very interesting. So what's the point? Um, and the point is that, um, <laughs> well, it's good to listen. It's neat to listen to. And I think, oh, do you have achieved something? I've made something I can hear. But they, it, it tells the scientists a lot about the Earth's uh, ionosphere and the magnetic field. That's what, that's what they want to learn about. And how those, those fields vary and how the ionosphere varies. So, there are quite a few satellites that have been brought up that just measure the, the Earth's magnetic field and these sorts of things. Mm. Any questions? What's the typical dimer that we're talking about out there? Um, I think they're talking about path lengths of uh, 7,000 kilometres. So, yeah, around half. So. But that's probably that close to one to one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, roughly 7,000, that sort of thing. Some of these obviously could be longer. Mm. It'll depend on, you know, how many electrons are probably up in the eye, honestly, I suspect. Mm. It's, uh, mm. Now, the other one which is interesting, and um, it's called the Dawn Chorus because it occurs around Dawn, and um, it occurs more frequently during magnetic storms especially during aurora, uh, aurora. and uh, I think that's, as I said, that's where I probably got interested because I was thinking, gee, it'd be nice to see an aurora, and I looked at some links. Of course, in the Northern Hemisphere, there are a lot more people live close to the pole than, than we yeah. are down here, so a lot more people see aurora out there. And that's uh, how I got interested. And um, so this is a really, this is an incredible one. It sounds like... <laughs> Sounds like a forest of birds. Yeah. In a drain pipe underwater. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in a large, uh, yeah, there's some googling going on. That's the babbling brook. And uh, so, uh, oh, this is good. Okay. So, when to listen, and um, basically, you can sort of listen at any, any time, but you won't hear all sorts of things, uh, some, some of those things at certain times. And, um, I'm not sure I need to read through that, but, uh, but um, yeah, the, the whistlers are a bit of a, a hard to hear, obviously, local, between midnight and an hour after sunrise, so not many people are up at that time, and it's a bit of a challenge to hear that. Mm. So I haven't, I haven't heard many whistlers at all. I haven't had that many late nights. You've probably recorded if you go to the receiver. Yeah, yeah I could have something like... The receiver's got to be, um, you need to be, well, you need to be a fair away from trees, you know, right. 100 metres from trees. Um, ideally, if you just want to hear it yourself, you need to be about six, five, 600 metres away from power lines. Oh, that's really yeah, hard. So that's hard, isn't it? So, yeah. but you can process the signal, so you just record it, and you can process the signal, you know, VSP, and get rid of the 60 depth anyway. Mm -hmm. I'll mention that later on. So. Okay, receivers. Um, so, yeah, it's a small signal, and. Um, so the basic receiver is just an audio amp. 
But the problem is connecting, uh, you've got a small antenna, a whip antenna is about 15 gigabarits. So you need an amplifier that doesn't attenuate that signal. So you need an amplifier with a bloody high impedance. <laughs> you know, 20 meg, 50 meg. It's pretty hard but to get much higher than that. But that's okay with a feed. You can do, yeah, and you can get 50 meg, 50 meg ohm resistors. Yeah. Yeah. If you go any higher, you start to have problems with mounting on a PC board and stuff. You know. mm -hmm. But there are other techniques, and, and you can get a reasonable signal. Yeah. I'll show you later on. Ideally, you need a band pass about 300 to 10 kilohertz. You want to cut out 50 hertz if you can. Um, and, but, and you don't need about 10 kilohertz, but you certainly want to cut out um, overload from radio stations. You might do. If you've got too much radio station, you might overload your front end and you'll, you'll be your radio station uh, detected coming through your front end. Um, yeah, or you can, you can record signals on a, uh, on a PC. Uh, record signals and process on a PC. And, um, and that'll get rid of 50 hertz. And I've seen techniques where they use a um, just a, a FET, little FET amplifier, feed it into a PC, straight into a PC. And so a few DSP programs around. In fact, there was a whole receiver program, um, another sideband receiver program I saw them, um, them last night. And, uh, you can do that. And the simplest antenna, and I've actually just got to show you. It's just got a simple wood antenna. Mm. Jeff, you coming camping this weekend? <laughs> no, like that. Bring your kit. Yeah. So that's uh, that's my receiver, and that other oh, whip's about. It's just a, uh, so that's all. You, that's all it is. Cool. You don't need much more than that. Comes on wheel the other way. And uh, it's quite crammed in there. I could probably do it smaller, but um, I've got conventional components. Um, the, the red one is actually for a, uh, you can connect a wire. With a long wire antenna, you, uh, you will actually get more signal. And, uh, and it will extend the frequency response. And uh, so you can go down to 10 hertz if you wanted to do that and pick up some of the signals there, which I haven't done actually. You need to process those, obviously, because most of them you probably not actually use. Once you get down below 50 hertz, they're not going to happen. Is it okay to pass around? Yeah. You want to remove the... Oh, I guess. <laughs> That's it. Take the lid off. We can probably do that later. Um, another technique is a uh, loop antenna. And they, you know, um, there are techniques for designing one. Uh, many turns, and you've got to get rid of the... When you've got a lot of turns, you've got a capacitance, you've got to get rid of that. So you can uh, use ferrite core, ferrite rod antennas, and that sort of thing, to uh, reduce the number of turns. And uh, it'll be balanced, so you'll get rid of a lot of the noise and, and 50 or 50 hertz. And there's a one designed by one of the, Princeton or someone that's a really fancy receiver, and the, 